Welcome to our next session, our session on future-proofing the industry, navigating geopolitical turmoil and planning for success. My name is Robert Willock. Uh, I work for The Economist Group, uh, more specifically for The Economist Intelligence Corporate Network, which is our briefing, advisory and networking service by which we try to help senior business leaders uh, navigate uh, the challenges and opportunities that we perceive uh, in the global and regional economies. So hopefully this will be an interesting session for you. Um, as well as hearing from me over the next 20 minutes, I'm then going to be joined for the remainder of the hour uh, by three fantastic panelists uh, whose names and pictures are up on the screen. I will introduce them in due course. But let me begin, first of all, with uh, a short presentation, and then that will set the scene nicely for our discussion. So if I could ask for my first slide to arrive, thank you very much. So there we are, uh, the topic at hand, future-proofing the industry, navigating geopolitical turmoil, and planning for success. So it's interesting when you look back at the archive of newspaper issues, and in my instance, The Economist, to see what's been happening in the world. Uh, you can tell that uh, we live in difficult times. In fact, you could say that we are in that period of history uh, that might have been characterized by the ancient Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. And interesting times, indeed, they are at the moment. So some of the things that are going on in the world at the moment, clearly war in Ukraine, and some of the implications of that war include uh, energy shock, big price rises for energy products. Here in our region, um, we still have some challenges, some turmoil, um, some social unrest in places like Iran. And then perhaps the big story of our era, uh, the thing that will probably characterize the rest of our working lives is the competitive uh, challenge uh, between the US and China, the race to become the world's largest and most influential uh, economy. And what we perceive at the moment is a big split developing between East and West, and I'll talk a little bit about that and what that might mean for us, both here in the region and in the world. And then, of course, we have our eyes on other potential developments, um, and all eyes really are in the South China Sea in Taiwan and wondering whether China will make a move uh, on that island. And of course, that would be something perhaps even more disruptive and terrible than uh, what we're seeing in Ukraine at the moment. So those are some of the big geopolitical issues that we're seeing. Uh, but with challenges come opportunities. This isn't all bad news for everybody. And uh, just to reference another issue of The Economist that we published back in the end of September, um, we are living through some pretty good, strong growth here in the GCC, particularly for the oil exporting countries of our region. Um, not only, of course, is our region benefiting from relatively high oil prices, it's also actually benefiting from being both geographically and politically in the middle of East and West. And it can really use that position and it can really use its influence to carve out a new role for itself uh, in global geopolitics. So, the region is not at the moment the center of geopolitical concerns as it has been in previous decades. And actually, we're even starting now to see some potential room for improvement, uh, perhaps um, a, a normalization of relations between Saudi and Iran. We've already, of course, seen a normalization of relations between the UAE and Israel. All things that probably five years ago were unthinkable, but which now uh, hopefully uh, lead to a more interesting, secure and prosperous future for the Middle East. These are our global risk scenarios for what they're worth. And these are the things that we are looking at and concerned. These are the things that could impact global growth, global security. Uh, these are divided into four areas, so politics, military risk, economic risk, and environmental risk. Uh, I'm not going to talk through all of those now, um, but clearly uh, the war in Ukraine uh, is set to continue for some time yet, and that is having serious knock-on effects 
Originally, it looked as if it was really going to affect mostly the Russian and Ukrainian economy, but there has been contagion, contagion into Eastern and um, Central and Western Europe in particular, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, the inflationary environment that has in part been driven by the higher energy prices that were caused by the war in Ukraine uh, is causing social unrest uh, in some parts of the world. Uh, and that, of course, is a challenge in terms of cost of living for people all around the globe. Focus quickly on the war in Ukraine, because I think um, a lot of people wonder where that's going and how that might come to a conclusion. But what's really interesting, actually, in our own analysis of the war in Ukraine is actually how opinions are slowly shifting. I think it's easy for those of us that consume, or in our case, produce a lot of Western media to think that the world is united in its condemnation of Vladimir Putin and his invasion of Ukraine, but it's actually not the case. If you look at the countries of the world um, in terms of their GDP contribution to the global economy, actually it is true that the vast majority of those countries condemn Russia and Russian actions. But if you look at the world in terms of global population, then you can see actually by the graph on the right that it's a much more nuanced and balanced view and that more countries are neutral and many more are Russian leaning in terms of this conflict. And that's partly because Russia and to some extent China have been doing quite a good job of persuading the global south developing economies that actually um, their interests don't lie with the hegemony of the West, with Europe and the US, that they've actually been mistreated and maltreated by those powers through the years. And this is an opportunity for them uh, to reset the balance. So we are likely to see this east-west divide uh, continuing, and that will, be, uh, that will be used certainly by Russia and by China to try to form new alliances and try to persuade some countries of the world that their interests uh, lie in the east rather than the west. So we are seeing uh, a slight movement of sentiment towards Russia, um, but largely by uh, those populous countries uh, in the global south. The implications of the war in Ukraine are threefold in our view. So obviously we've seen the commodity price spikes. Um, that's led to inflation. And we think that actually commodity prices, both hard, hard commodities like oil, steel, rubber, those prices are going to remain elevated. They're coming down off the peak that we saw in the middle of 2022, but they're likely to remain higher than they were pre-war and pre-pandemic for some time yet to come. Same for some uh, soft commodities for grains, for breads, foodstuffs. Um, so that will help to bring down inflation as those prices ease, but inflation is proving to be quite sticky. So 9.3% on average last year in the globe, down to 7% we forecast this year. That cost of living crisis hasn't gone away yet. And as I said, chances of social unrest as a result of that, we're seeing a lot of strike action taking place uh, in countries, particularly in Europe, as uh, workforces demand pay settlements commensurate with the higher costs of living that they're experiencing. Central banks responding to these inflationary pressures by tightening monetary policy, uh, tightening monetary policy by increasing um, interest rates to try to tame inflation. But again, it's proving difficult. It's proving to take a longer time than people thought. We're expecting the latest meeting of the Federal Reserve today in the US to take place later uh, when we expect another hike um, from the American Central Bank. And of course, here in our region, where most of, the most of the currencies are pegged to the dollar, we will follow. So money is getting more expensive. What's the terminal rate going to be for these central bank rates? Um, we think probably that interest rates will continue to rise until probably around the middle of this year in the US, in Europe, in the UK in particular. Um, and then the pivot may well happen towards the end of this year or early next, and then rates will start to come down if inflation gets back to its target levels. And then the other impact of the war has been the effect on growth. And as I said earlier, whilst initially it looked as if 
the effect of the war was really going to be limited to Russia and Ukraine itself. We've seen some contagion, particularly into Europe. So last year, it had about half a percentage point hit to the European Union uh, economy, uh, which was at 3.5%. This year, we're forecasting really, really sluggish growth, stagnation, if you like, across Europe, and a two percentage point hit to European growth caused almost entirely directly by the war in Ukraine. So stagnation this year in developed economies, um, with the exception of China, which has just lifted in the past few months its zero COVID policy, which was so harmful to economic growth in China, and which now means that China is on a very fast rebound and we're going to see very fast growth in China. Question we're asked all the time, are we going to see a global recession? Um, in our view, we are not. In fact, actually, the picture is slowly brightening. If you'd have asked us for our global GDP forecast um, in January, uh, we'd have been predict predicting a 1.7% GDP growth this year. Well, we're now at 2.1% as actually Europe and America has started to perform better than we imagined. But there are still risks. And in 2024, we are expecting further improvement helped by the rebound of those European and US Northern American economies. But actually most of the fast growth this year and into next is going to come from non-OECD developing markets uh, and they are driving growth. So if you look at that graph on the right, you can see where the fast growth is coming from. You can see those economies that are going to be stagnating in 2023 and you can see where we're going to experience mild recessions. That includes in some major European economies like Germany and the UK. So geopolitics playing their part, interest rates, that era of low interest rates, low inflation has gone, and the tough decisions that are going to have to be taken by governments now uh, really exacerbate the importance of good governance. Here is our map showing our forecasts of global growth this year. Uh, this is a heat map, so anything looking red or orange is fast growth, anything looking blue is slow growth, and you can see there that stagnation in Europe, uh, quite clearly defined by this map here. But hot spots as well, hot spots all around the world. Um, as I mentioned, China bouncing back very strongly from a couple of very disappointing years of growth um, in China. A rebound this year to 5.7%, getting it back onto that 5% plus growth track that we've come to experience uh, and expect from China. But some other beneficiaries around Asia from that US-China conflict as companies uh, look to de-risk their businesses, reroute their supply chains away from China. So places like Vietnam, places like Bangladesh, really starting to get significant investment and foreign direct investment now India's going to have a very good year this year as well. Um, and into Africa, it's the middle-sized economies of Africa that are experiencing fast growth this year, and the big economies of Africa, Nigeria, South Africa, that continue uh, to disappoint. Middle East doesn't look super exciting, but actually following a very, very strong 2022, remain actually quite positive this year. As the oil price remains relatively high, notwithstanding the fact that it's come off uh, those recent highs in the last week or so, we can expect the economies here to be growing at above the trend rate that we saw before the pandemic. And that's very good news for our region indeed. China, um, here's a bold forecast for you. Um, so our longer term forecast, and you can take that with a pinch of salt because the longer a forecast runs, uh, the more unreliable it is. But our view is that China will actually overtake um, the US in terms of size of economy uh, by around 2030, and that it will continue to have that global leadership of uh, the uh, world's economy uh, all the way through to the end of our long-range forecast period out to 2050. Although, of course, China, China's economy will have to normalize. It does have some structural challenges, not uh, uh, including um, population challenges. We're starting to see China's population uh, peak and decline. Uh, and, of course, the impact of that trade war uh, that continues uh, with the U.S. But, of course, the U.S. will look at slides like this and consider its own position as the world's largest economy and think, what can it do about that? And this map here shows you how things have changed over the last 20 years. 
The map on the left shows um, the major source of imports per country. Um, and that's gone from blue, which is the US, to red over that 20-year period. So these are the sorts of things that Donald Trump was looking at when he decided to change US policy towards China and impose sanctions, uh, impose tariffs uh, to ensure that China didn't get the opportunity to overtake the US. And it's been partially successful, but I don't think that a zero-sum game um, will ultimately prevail for the US. Joe Biden hasn't shown any signs of undoing Trump's policies towards China, uh, and the US uh, policy towards China seems to be baked in now, no matter who's in the White House. So the big risk here for us is that we see a bifurcation of politics and technology between East and West. It's not beyond the realms of imagination to follow that through to its logical conclusion and see potentially a complete division of technology between East and West. Two incompatible internets uh, as suspicion increases between those major uh, global powers and they start to weaponize their tech industries and prevent access uh, to each other uh, from critical infrastructure, uh, government, and private sector organizations. So pay attention to global alliances, pay attention to who's friends with whom, because that ultimately could uh, determine where you are going to be able to operate um, and how easy uh, that will be. So choosing sides, particularly for those of us that are here in the middle, the Middle East is absolutely geographically and politically in the middle, the UAE, Saudi, India, many countries around this region trying to ensure that they can remain friendly with both sides to get the benefits of um, US tech, US security, Chinese tech, Chinese investments. It's a very difficult balancing act uh, to perform at the moment. So that brings me to the end of this first session. I'll just conclude with these five points here, which I think hopefully will sum up some of the issues that we're looking at at The Economist and which we're talking to our, uh, our clients about. Uh, so actually, we think that the economy has proved to be more resilient than we were concerned about at the back end of 2022, when there was a lot of talk about global recession. Uh, China's rebound is good news for the global economy, and we're starting to see improvements uh, across both developed and developing economies. Inflation is starting to trend down, but slowly. So remember, 9.3% on average globally last year, 7% this year, uh, but uh, it's going to be a while before it gets back to pre-pandemic, pre-war levels, and then interest rates start to come down. People are still spending. That's the good news. Actually, the consumer has been the savior of many Western economies um, over the last few months, US in particular. Um, don't forget, actually, people didn't have much of a chance to spend money during the pandemic, and we're starting to see some of that, what we call revenge spending, taking place now. And that includes, of course, travel and tourism, as people now take advantage to move in a way that they couldn't during the two and a half years uh, of the pandemic. Point four, I've touched on geopolitics, protectionism, the weaponization of businesses and technology, uh, new eras for defense and energy, and uh, we're going to have to pay very close attention to who's friends with whom and how those relationships are developing. New supply chains uh, developing all the time. So organizations thinking about where they can make those investments, where those investments are going to be safe, where they're not going to be subject to tariffs, uh, and where actually they're not going to be subject to the kind of disruptions that we've seen caused by war in Europe and, of course, the pandemic. And then just to finish on that point, which I think probably is one of the most important points at the moment in terms of the global economy, the return to growth of China, where COVID cases rose after the end of zero COVID, but have peaked fast. And there is a lot of pent up demand in China that is ready to work into the global economy. So the opportunities of a strong rebound for China are clear and obvious, hopefully, for the travel and tourism industry. So while the rest of us are still perhaps living under that curse of where you live in interesting times, the Chinese economy, at least, uh, is back from uh, its slump. So there we are. That's 20 minutes from me to set the scene. Uh, and now I would like to invite up onto the stage uh, our panelists to discuss some of this and more. Uh, please welcome, if you will, up to the stage, 
and I'll ask you to change the slides over, please, our panelists. So please join me in welcoming Guy Hutchinson, President and CEO of Rotana, one of the leading hotel and management companies in the region with hotels across the Middle East, Africa, Eastern Europe, and Turkey. Guy, if you can kind of sit underneath your picture. Um, Muzamil Asain is the CEO of Al Masafa, Saudi Arabia's leading travel company, elevating the journey for travelers from Saudi Arabia and beyond uh, while harnessing parent company Sira Group's 40 years of expertise. And then last but not least, Muzamil, can I ask you to sit on that one? Because otherwise I'm going to get confused. <laughs> <laughs> Johan Eidhagen, uh, the MD of Wizz Air Abu Dhabi, um, took that position in February this year, uh, having been with Wizz Air since 2015, having joined as head of brand and marketing. Um, welcome, gentlemen. You have uh, handheld microphones. Uh, well, there's a spare one there. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. And um, these are challenging uh, and interesting times. Um, and I wonder how much geopolitics plays on the mind of C-suite business leaders such as yourself. It's clearly not always at the top of your intray, but is this something that you pay particular attention to? Are you conscious of changing alliances, of geopolitics, uh, and of the risks and the opportunities uh, that some of these big subjects bring? I'll start with you, Guy. Is this is this something that exercises your mind every day? The answer to that is absolutely. You know, because if you take tourism and travel, particularly in this region, I mean, the, the growth of the domestic tourism customer is something relatively new and uh, maybe ex accelerated a little bit over the COVID years. But it's still not, you know, a fundamental, it's, it's an important segment, but actually the key drivers of our business, particularly the hotel industry, the key drivers of our business are still international inbound markets. So any disruption that happens in sort of global geopolitical uh, environment, it's something we always pay a lot of attention to because our business is absolutely driven by inbound or global markets traveling into the region. Thank you, Guy. We'll get into the weeds with that a little bit later, I think, and talk to you about how your source markets are changing. Yeah. Uh, Johan, um, same question for you really. I mean, clearly you're operating flights outbound to some interesting destinations and uh, to what extent are you paying attention to geopolitics at the moment? I, I you know, it's um, probably one of the most important things that we do as an airline. I mean, it's part of our safety and security system to also monitor developments. Uh, you know, we have um, uh, on the one side I think it, it shapes and moves uh, how we build our network quite a lot. I mean, you can see the, uh, the impact of Ukraine uh, has had on our own network, uh, the movements we've had to make, how it's impacted also uh, inbound traffic into uh, Abu Dhabi and Dubai as well. So it is part of our, our model, not only to monitor it from an operational point of view, but also monitor it from a, um, a pattern of travel and how it affects uh, travel patterns across the world. Thank you, Hern. And Muzumil, finally to you, and, and clearly quite a Saudi-focused business, and you're reading the he same headlines that I am about making friends again with Iran, yeah. and of course questions about whether Saudi will normalize relations with Israel, but things are moving fast. And, and, and how are you perceiving potential opportunities that might arise from these um, geopolitical developments? Yeah, I think um, we use COVID as an interesting time. It, it wasn't because of geopolitics, but actually COVID provided a way where you need to inform customers where they can go and how they can go. And, and we see that with a lot of the opening up of the region again, you have a lot of easier access to visas, easier access. So our job is to educate customers where they can go and how they can go. And example, a great example of opening up again was uh, last year when Saudi reopened its uh, borders with Thailand, allowing Thai citizens to come into Saudi and Saudis to go to Thailand. Now Thailand is one of our top destinations. Uh, our job as a, as a travel agency uh, as an agent to the customers, educate them about where they can go, what they can do. And, and Thailand was a great example. Uh, also Turkey, for example. And, and, and now uh, there's a lot of interest, even at ATM from uh, uh, Iran, as they're starting to reopen flights from Saudi to Iran for Iranians to come to Saudi again uh, and Saudi to go to Iran. Thank you. Well, I'll stay with you uh, on that point and then I'll move back down the line again. But I'd be very interested to understand um, 
what interest you're seeing both from Saudis in terms of the destinations they're interested in, but also what you're perceiving in terms of global interest in Saudi as well. So you know, where, where does Saudi fit into the global tourism industry, both as a source market, but also as a destination? Sure. Uh, as a source market, um, historically, and, and continue to be Saudi travelers, continue to be uh, frequent lovers of international travel. Uh, they travel quite often, uh, travel for long durations. Uh, we released, recently released a report that uh, travel destination lengths of stay have increased by over 15% just uh, since pre-COVID levels. Uh, top destinations continue to be the, the Londons, the Paris, Dubai, Cairo, but also a lot of new destinations internationally. Uh, Thailand, I mentioned, Turkey is back on top. Uh, we see a lot of interest now in, in Greece and other parts of the world. Um, domestic is also strong for Saudi, so that's a new market that happened post-COVID. But at the same time, uh, they continue to travel and stay in, in you know, five-star, four-star property, and they're high spenders. So, so that will continue from the Saudi perspective. On the inbound side, what, you're, what you're, we're seeing is a lot of interest for the upcoming project in the kingdom. Uh, already, Alula is very well known, uh, as we know, but also a lot of interest about the upcoming projects of the Red Sea, uh, and, and, and really in increased demand from Europe inbound into the kingdom, especially as uh, flight connectivity is increasing with, with the support of the Wiz Airs and the Vinas and Saudis of the world. Thank you very much, Muzamil. Johan, um, Muzamil talked about new destinations, and I guess um, that's going to always be a hot topic for an airline and, and, and where you see opportunities to open new routes. Um, Tell us a little bit, bit about the destinations that you're exploring, either the ones that you've recently announced or where else uh, Wizz Air Abu Dhabi might go. Um, and also perhaps give us a little bit of an insight into whether this is a, a pull or a push process. Are you thinking about what's possible and then marketing that to customers or are you getting demand that you perceive from customers and then responding to that? You know, um, our, our ultra low cost model is really about building demand. So. You know, a lot of what we do is not really about tapping into what existing carriers are doing in market, but actually finding new patterns of travel, new uh, unserved markets, unserved demand. Uh, most of the markets that we're going into have been unserved by uh, low fares, by uh, regular traffic, by a uh, brand such as ours. And therefore, we're moving Wizz Air into those markets uh, by providing affordable travel. And this is a way that we build the market. So in a lot of cases, you know, what we're doing is creating demand. Passengers are getting the chance to travel maybe for the second time in a year. Maybe they're able to bring their families home for, for their holidays. Uh, you know, we're creating opportunity for small businesses to travel more often, more frequently. So most of this is actually tapping into either an um, unused demand or, or a market which is, um, and I wouldn't say untapped, but unserved for the customer that we're looking for. And quite a lot of it. And and when you talk about new markets, I mean, uh, pretty much uh, the world is our oyster as long as we can reach it within six uh, six hours from here, and as long as uh, we can get the designations, the permits, and and enter the market. But you know, there's so much untapped demand and so much untapped growth in this region that it's just screaming for access to lower fares. Uh, so you can pretty much draw a line around Abu Dhabi and choose which market it is. I think it's more the challenge we have is really about making the choices uh, out of the opportunities and the possibilities that we have. Which ones to come uh, are going to be the ones which are probably more beneficial for uh, the UAE and which are probably more beneficial for us in terms of being able to scale that market up. Because actually there's so many places you could go, you've got to prioritize. Exactly. exactly. And you know, the, the challenge for us is not really about finding new markets. The challenge is you know, how open are those markets to be able to scale up? Because it's no point in us going into a market and, and operating a route for, uh, you know, three times a week and then stopping there. It has to be, uh, the, you have to be, have the regulatory opportunity to really grow it uh, so that if you want to invest into a market, you want to be able to fly it double, triple, four times daily. Uh, that has to be the vision. Thank you, Johan. And Guy, over to you and, and talk to us a little bit about your growth plans, what are the markets in the region that excite you, and, and how is your customer base changing and how might you expect it to change given some of the geopolitical challenges and opportunities we've seen, people making friends, falling out, um, and are you seeing um, big shifts in the, the, the customer demographic for Rotana at the moment? 
Honestly, I, I, I believe we are uh, blessed to be in this region uh, at this point in time, you know, and uh, I don't think there's anywhere else in the world that consistently, uh, and that's not just in the UAE, but across Saudi Arabia, that has such a structured approach to the development of tourism and travel, you know, where there is not only um, talk, but there's this, this, this high-level commitment of the part or the place that tourism and travel needs to take in the economy. And we're seeing that always been the case in the UAE for the last 20 or 30 years. We're seeing that now emerging extremely strongly in Saudi Arabia. So I think uh, as an industry, as a hotel company, we could not be in a better place at this point in time in terms of how the region is focusing increasingly on tourism and travel. And that's helping to fuel our growth. Um, and what comes with that is, you know, this, this amazing focus in, in terms of planning. You know, I worked for one of the best mentors I ever worked for, always said to me, you know, guy, you know, plan the work, work the plan. You know, and when you see the quality of, of planning, strategy around specifically and collaboration around tourism and travel, that brings a very, a superior operating environment for a company like us. So you've seen, that's why, you know, destinations like Dubai have just accelerated consistently in terms of growth, come out of COVID stronger than before. You know, we're not... You're no really experiencing that revenge travel, are you? You know, lo you know, well, it's not revenge travel. It is planned, it's planned, segmented, executed tourism strategy and development. You know, and it's about not just single market focus, it's about diversification of markets. It's about having multiple markets traveling into the destination so you're not overexposed to any one market. And it's about creating this unique environment, which I think the UAE has done so spectacularly well, of being this destination of safety and security and quality of tourism experience, second to none, where everybody is welcome. And how is that manifesting itself in the demographic of, of your customers? Have, what are you, I mean, can you be specific about how that is changing and has changed over the last year or two? I think the most interesting thing is that you've seen the traditional markets that have always served um, the, the region well, the likes of Saudi Arabia, which is a critical market for the region, UK, Germany, You've seen the, Russia was always important to the, to, the, to the regional markets. You've seen these markets really come back stronger than ever. But we've seen also the introduction of new markets, markets that never traditionally traveled into the region. Latin America, you know, we, I have a hotel in Dubai where Mexico is one of their top performing markets. Ten years ago, that just wasn't a factor. So the strength of this destination, and I think UAE has led that platform, but we've seen now Qatar get into the space. I think this is the space that Saudi Arabia is also going to grow into, that you've seen the ability, that, that ability to execute that tourism development strategy. There are actually very few destinations around the world, even mature destinations like London, Paris, Italy, that are doing it at the level that the regional markets here are doing and bringing in this focus on tourism. So we've seen those traditional platforms come back stronger than ever, and we've seen new markets just being laid into it, which is helping us to increase yields, helping us with diversification, and it's just creating this great platform for growth. Fantastic, thank you, Guy. I, I wanted to ask about um, some of the new middle classes that are perhaps driving some of this. You mentioned places like South America, but at the same, it, it, it almost sounds contradictory. At the same time as we've got a bit of a cost of crisis living going on in the world, we are also seeing uh, the development of new middle classes and the ability to spend and move and travel. Um, perhaps, uh, Johan, I'll come to you on that one first, because I guess, you know, as a low-cost airline, you're trying to appeal to people who don't want to spend an enormous amount on, on their flights, but still want to, you know, quality, uh, reliability, safety, all of those things. So... How is the cost of living crisis, if we can call it that, which is derived from some of those geopolitical challenges that I spoke about earlier, how is that playing out for a business like yours? And are we seeing a new middle class emerge? And also, perhaps, are we seeing travelers who perhaps used to splurge on full service now thinking about 
trading um, the, that full service for a lower cost. Yeah, uh, we could talk an hour about this. <laughs> I'm not going to. Uh, you know, the changes you see in, in travel is a couple of things. One is, you know, co the cost of living crisis and any type of um, uh, situation where customers have to hold on to their money a little bit tighter pushes them into more low-cost brands. Uh, not just aviation, uh, food, uh, groceries, day-to-day uh, -day spending, etc., and so on. Travel actually hasn't uh, decreased. It's just a choice of travel, which has been. It's good for uh, my colleague on the right here because you know the less money they spend on their spend on their five uh, four-hour flight, the more money they can spend on their hotel room, the more money they can spend on the restaurants, the more money, and that's just how people is thinking. You know, it's really about how to manage your uh, disposable income. I think the second thing that we see quite a lot is that uh, business travel has decreased with the increase in uh, which came out of COVID, working from home, uh, use of uh, Zoom calls, et cetera, and so on. Uh, this has meant that people have enough, uh, a need to travel more in their private life. So people are actually choosing to travel more just because they want to get away from uh, working from home and getting to see these experiences. So actually, I think this is tr just, you know, the, 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 the last couple of years have driven a increase in demand in travel in general, but a difference in tonality, a difference in choice. People are just becoming more conscious, more they can access data, information, they can go on any website in the world from anywhere and they can find out exactly what the prices are. They can book everything themselves. They can easily swipe a credit card from home. You know, it's so simple today that if you want to be smart about your, your spending, you can. And you can see this across everything. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Muslim, I mean, you know, with, with a Saudi clientele, um, are, there, are you seeing uh, cost of living pressures there as well, or, 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 or are your customers largely immune from this? I mean, I think... Uh... Hello? I think, um, actually, as Johan said, actually we're seeing people fly uh, low-cost carriers more, but stay at more five-star hotels. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, they're staying longer. And they're flying uh, low-cost carriers. So, like in the first five, five months of the year, almost 56% of our were booking for a low-cost carrier, but 60% of our bookings were five and four-star. So it, it's it's when a, a carrier like uh, like with Air or Fly Ideal enter the market, they create also accessibility, more frequent flights, uh, people can travel more, uh, and we're really really seeing that. Uh, at the same time, uh, we see also a rise in domestic tourism, but not to take away from the international trip. International is growing and so is domestic. So people are continuing to spend more on travel. Uh, I do think that there may be inflationary pressures in the kingdom, but it hasn't impacted the travel segment yet. Okay, thank you very much. Guy, um, as a hotel operator, how are you responding to the cost of living crisis, as, as, we're, as we're calling it globally, but obviously affecting particular markets? Interesting that Johan was saying that perhaps people are spending less on flights, but maintaining spend on hotels. Are you seeing any of these behaviors within your own group? Are people still spending good money for rooms? Are they also spending on food and drink? Are they also spending on leisure activities? How's the, how's the spending holding up in, in your establishments? Um, you know, I think it's, it's, been a, it's been a fascinating trend um, because, you know, if you go back 18 months ago, and, and I always used to have a sort of tongue-in-cheek approach in the back of my mind when thinking about it. There was so much talk about, you know, what the new normal will be of travel. I think that's probably the fastest dispelled <laughs> myth in living memory, right? You know, the speed at which that travel came back, and you just saw how important that concept of travel was from a societal perspective. You know, and I think when you look at that combination of low-cost carriers on buying into five-star hotels, I think it's about capacity. You know, we can't grow without capacity. So having an operator like Wizz Air in Abu Dhabi is amazing to us because the more capacity we can bring into a destination, the more we can benefit. I, I think across the board, uh, yields have come back stronger than ever. So I think that's across industry. I think whether you look at hotels, where you look at airlines, if you look at ticketing costs in airlines, I mean, yields have come across stronger than ever. And we're seeing that across the board. We're seeing that in dining. We're seeing that at Hotels, I think we're all experienced of this in airlift, you know, and uh, so the cost of travel as a holistic experience, entertainment, 
has gone up probably 20, 20 percent versus 2018 or 2019. But there's no sign of demand diminishing, no matter what cost of living pressures are there. I think at some point, there might be a correction that will come, you know, at some point down the road, not immediately, but I think at some point, there will probably some, be some minor correction on pricing. But, you know, the, the importance of travel globally as a society, I think, has just been highlighted by how those yields have grown and how people, you know, how fast they return to travel and dining and socialization and business travel and meetings and events. You know, this all rebounded almost instantly. I think if I cast my mind back, you know, five, eight years, one of the big topics that seemed to characterize the, the travel and tourism industry was the, and particularly here in this region, was the rise of the mid-market hotel, the three-star hotel. Um, tell me how that's developing. Is that still a thing? Is that still important in the mix of accommodation, say in the UAE, in Saudi? I mean, we talked about lower cost air travel. Are people also looking to perhaps, um, you know, spend less, re remove some of the luxuries that they might expect from the five-star hotel segment um, in order to still be able to access places to stay? Or actually, when people, when it comes to accommodation, are people still, in this region at least, looking for an element of luxury? Um, you know, for me, that's just segmentation. It, it's not necessarily a transfer from right. five-star. It's the growth and the maturation right. of these destinations. It's, it's how these how these cities are maturing right. and having that segmentation is absolutely critical because you need luxury, you need five star, you need three and four star, you need lifestyle and you need hotel apartments which is also a very important yeah, yeah. segment okay. and it's one of the things that Dubai I think particularly has done extremely well because if you look at the segmentation and accommodation in Dubai it's very well diversified across luxury, five star, three star hotel apartments, it's a very balanced development yeah, yeah. and that's the sign of a mature market. So I don't think it's necessarily people transferring down the segments. That's an important part of growth. If you really want to establish a mature destination, you've got to be able to serve those segments. And in some cases, we serve the same customer across multiple segments. You'll serve them into luxury, you'll serve them into five-star. Depending on their you'll, travel reasons or You'll service them into a hotel apartment, you'll service them into our central brand, which is a three or four-star yeah. lifestyle brand. So it, it's an important part of destinations maturing and over time. Okay, thank you. I talked uh, in my presentation quite a lot about China, the reopening of China post the end of zero COVID. Um, and I'm sure that uh, there are many um, tourist sectors uh, here in our region that will welcome back Chinese tourists in large numbers. Guy, starting with you again, are you seeing the return of, of, of Chinese customers in a big way? And if so, uh, you know, what are their preferences shaping up to be in this sort of post pandemic world? And not yet. And I think, you know, the weight of China is yet to be seen. And I was talking to a colleague in China, actually in the airline industry yesterday, and, and he was explaining to me that airlift out of China is still at around 50%. So, you know, the, the, the ability to travel out of China is not yet 100%. And, and the Chinese traveler will more likely revisit those traditional destinations, Thailand, Paris, London, Rome, New York, before they start to venture out. So, which is good for us, you know, honestly, if that intervention, if that uplift from China comes in quarter one or quarter two next year, the timing of that would, for us would be absolutely perfect, you know? So it's gonna come, but it's gonna take a little bit longer. Thank you. Muzumil, did you wanna add something to that? I think, I think um, well, for China, for, for Saudi Arabia, it's a fairly new market, but already we've, we've, we've sent our team and in cooperation with Visit Saudi, have been to China, been to Asia, to actually start preparing uh, and educating the customers about uh, Saudi Arabia is a destination uh, for uh, China, for Chinese travelers, and uh, they're increasing the connectivity. So it will take time, but it will definitely be uh, a, an important source market in the future. Thank you. And then, Johan, obviously, you know, your, your flights don't originate from China, but are you seeing Chinese customers who are visiting the region then using your flights for regional travel? Is that happening? Uh, I, I would almost say it's too early to tell. I think, you know, if you look at the demand, how it built up before uh, the UAE or for Europe after COVID, it takes a little bit of time. Uh, you know, you have to unpack aircraft, you have to retrain pilots, etc. and so on. So, you know, it's not just like turning on a switch and you're at full capacity. I mean, China will probably be faster than any other economy in the world to move forward. And I, I think this is going to be the next uh, 
big wave of travelers which is going to come. I yeah. think it's a question of when and uh, rather than if. Okay. Um, just a follow-up question to the economic question. We obviously talked about cost of living crisis. One of the other things I wanted to ask you was about currency movements and, and whether this is something that impacts us here in the region. I, I, I said earlier that obviously we are, at least for the GCC economies, even to some extent Kuwait, pegged to the dollar. And the dollar has for some time now been, been quite strong, which I guess makes us quite expensive for a lot of inbound tourists. Is that something um, that you're seeing an impact of or actually, I mean, you know, are there, are there source markets that are coming and going because of uh, currency um, markets or is, is that overplayed? Is that something that, that we don't need to worry about too much? It's just the, the cut and thrust of, of FX. We've seen it uh, on the inbound side into the religious segment, into Saudi Arabia. So countries like Egypt, uh, Pakistan, and Turkey have been quite impacted in their ability to, to spend and, and spend on their religious tourism uh, for certain of the middle class or lower, lower middle class population that do come. Uh, so that's been challenging. And also a challenge has been uh, some countries now have a lot of restrictions on dollar movements, a movement of currency out of the kingdom, this is out, of, out of their country into the kingdom or anywhere else. So that's been making it a bit difficult for the middle class or lower middle class to travel for the religious pilgrimage, but the luxury segment hasn't been impacted. No, okay, guys, same question for you. Uh, I mean, are you, are you conscious of the fact that uh, a hotel stay in the UAE or Saudi is a little bit more expensive for a lot of your source markets at the moment, just because of that, uh, because of that currency situation at the moment? Um, yes, it's something we pay a lot of attention to. You know, um, fortunately for us, I mean, there's certain destinations, and, and again, Dubai is a great example. It just holds its value. You know, you know, so it's very strong. I mean, for us, that impact is much more uh, noticeable, and we, we we watch it more closely in places like Egypt, where the currency fluctuation plays a big part, in Turkey, where the, and in Le and countries like Lebanon. So there are countries where we operate where those currency fluctuations have a much bigger impact on business and and makes things reasonably difficult. But I think in the Gulf countries, it's less of an issue. Thank you. And then, Johan, just on, on that question for you as well, not only for your customers, but I guess also for you in terms of operational costs, is, is this something that you pay close attention to? I mean, it's something that we, we live on because, of course, we pay uh, half our cost in dollars. So uh, aircraft leasing, fuel, etc., so on. It's it's super important for us to be on, t on top of it. Uh, but at the same time, you know, this is still what I, you know, don't let a good crisis go to waste, which is, you know, we're, we're operating at 85% load factor right now. Uh, we've doubled our capacity in the past year. We're going to double our capacity this year. Uh, it's actually not a problem for us. It's actually probably fueling a little bit of the, uh, of the uh, movement and demand that we're seeing as well, which is that, but it, I would be concerned that if it continues over a longer period of time, that you know, you're gonna have to be competitive. I mean, the one thing that strikes me is, and I haven't had a chance to walk around everywhere, but I, when will I get a chance as a consumer to visit all these places available out here? I mean, the competition for tourism, weekend breaks, for destinations, places to go out of the UAE is incredible. And it's the same way around. I mean, you have, to, you know, this is, the challenge for me is really about being competitive in this whole landscape, which is just booming out of the seams. Everybody here is announcing that their new tourism targets for next year is X amount uh, multiplied versus previous year. Uh, it's going to be very tough here if you're going to have to be very competitive to be, to be uh, if you're going to um, kind of like win the game of tourism. <laughs> Winning the game of tourism. Well, uh, as the, as the cl oh, uh, am I allowed to take questions from the floor? I think I, I surely am. Um, I don't know how we're going to get a microphone over to you, sir. Um, I think Lucy's coming over. Bear with us. So I was just going to start winding up, but you have the honour, sir, of, uh, of asking a question of our panellists. Just to yep. introduce you. Tell us who you are and where you're from. Abs and then absolutely, Mr. Wilcock. Uh, my name is Mthiaz Mukbul. I'm the executive editor of Travel Impact Newswire based in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, my question to Mr. Mazambil Hussain. Um, one of the big geopolitical trends of this century has been... Uh, over the last two decades, the effort to malign the name of the of the religion of Islam and keep the world uh, keep the Islamic world divided and destabilized. Uh, the Saudis now seem to be taking a lead in trying to patch that up. 
particularly with the with the with the help of China, uh, and 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 bring peace to some of the regions and bring the Islamic world back together again. Uh, where do you see that going? This seems to be a very positive move forward and will certainly be good for business. Uh, but do you see that as being possible going forward? And is there an end game to that? And of course, you mentioned Thailand, which was a very positive development where I come from. Uh, so certainly, it seems to be part of a much broader policy uh, by the Saudis. Uh, how do you think this is going to change the geopolitical uh, picture of the world at large? and uh, how much uh, benefit for travel and tourism and business as well. Thank you for the question. I, I didn't catch all of that. I don't know how the sound was for you guys. But Muslim, I, I think the question was about uh, Saudi's influence and, and, and the development of better relations across the Islamic world. Was that it largely? Okay. Yeah, I, I think uh, in general, I think you, we see in this region, whether it's Saudi, UAE, or anywhere else in the region, trying to continue to promote uh, 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 peace to try to drive additional uh, uh, collaboration across countries, regions. And we've seen a, a big improvement of that in the last five years, really. Uh, and that's going to continue uh, to allow more, which then has a direct impact on travel and tourism. More connectivity, more accessibility, easier visa access. World in particular, uh, uh, the recent announcement drive additional inbound for, for Mecca and for Medina. That I think it will continue. Uh, a lot of positive trends, and it's important uh, to have that stability in the region. Uh, UAE has always been a place for when instability happens outside, uh, people end up coming here. I think we've seen that with the recent uh, Russian and Ukraine uh, crisis, and we think that'll continue across the rest of the region as well. Thank you, Mr. Mill. Um, gentlemen, either of you want to pick up on that uh, question? I mean, if I could just say one point, which I think is important, I think that uh, you know, openness is is super important in this, and. and you know, the one thing we learned out of COVID was that how important it is that people choose the destination they go to based upon how easy it is. Uh, easy uh, entry, visas, etc., and so on. I mean, and there was this, during COVID, this fear that people started having, which is, uh, if you remember at the beginning, you know, getting stuck somewhere. Uh, you know, and this is still in the hearts and minds of a lot of people, especially people like my parents who are, like what happens if something, you know, can I, will I get stuck there, et cetera? How easy will it be? And it's still, you know, the UAE, I think, has been leading this. I think the Saudis are really now uh, on the, uh, the march to this, making it easy and accessible. And this is probably the one thing you have to do. If you want to create a platform for uh, travel, for tourism, to be able to do this, you have to also have an open culture where you allow competition, you allow uh, also the ease of travel, and you can't just have a... Uh, I don't know, whatever happens type of approach that, well, maybe I'll get in, maybe I don't. Johan, thank you for that. I, the, the, the clock is blinking red at me, so I think we'd better wind that up now. Um, but uh, thank you for your attention, everybody. Thank you as well to my wonderful panelists, to Muzamil, to Johan, and to Guy. Please join me uh, in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. I wish you all a wonderful rest of ATM. Wonderful to see the place so busy and, uh, and travel and tourism in such rude health again after some difficult years. So thank you very much.